We good? Yeah. Mm-hmm. What do you think about the hat? Should I keep that? I think they'll take me seriously if I wear this hat. So let's talk about minerals. I think the first thing uh, in a minerals video should really be defining what a mineral is. Yeah. So I'm a sucker for textbooks. Geologists define a mineral as a naturally occurring solid crystalline substance, usually inorganic with a specific chemical composition. There you go. That's all we really need to. Are you kidding me? Oh, we say we break those down. So homogenous. Um, that simply means can't be broken into smaller constituents. I like to think about it in terms of like salad dressing. Maybe not the best example, but first one that's coming to my mind. So if you have like an oil vinaigrette with oil and a bunch of other stuff, you'll note that that salad dressing separates. When you shake it up so it's all mixed together, you're effectively homogenizing that salad dressing. You want it to be you know, all one thing. Minerals, you can't break them down. So this thing is homogenous. If I break this calcite crystal down, it's going to then be two calcite crystals, but we're not going to get anything out of it. Homogenous, naturally occurring. Yeah. I think you know what that means occurs in nature, not man-made. I think that was pretty self-explanatory. Solid crystalline substance. Well, solid simply just means not gas, not liquid. I think that's, that's pretty straightforward. Crystalline substance, really what that means is each mineral, feldspar, calcite, whatever it is, has a predictable 3D atomic structure that is the same every time in that mineral. So calcite always has the same 3D atomic structure. So finally, a specific chemical composition. And that just simply means that each one of these minerals, whether it's fluorite, magnetite, another fluorite, feldspar, calcite, for example, always have a specific mixture of um, ions that make this up. For example, calcite, calcium carbonate, CaCO3 is one calcium and then one carbonate ion. And that's always gonna be the case for this. Quartz is an easy one to remember, this little guy here. Um, SiO2, one silicon to two oxygen. That's always going to be the case for quartz. And then the definition says usually inorganic. That's kind of vague. So you can generally just think about it as inorganic. And that broadly means was never alive. More specifically, it means it doesn't incorporate organic carbon into the chemical composition. So the carbon molecules in here um, are inorganic and not organic carbon. Now that we've defined a mineral, I think uh, a common question is, what's the difference between a rock and a mineral? I mean, look at this thing. Looks like a rock to me. I mean, that would definitely hurt if it hit you or if somebody threw it at you, which by all accounts is a pretty good definition for a rock for a non-geologist. I think the best way to think about it is in terms of Legos. All of these Legos, we could do it by color, right? These are the white Legos. These could all be the same mineral. And these gray Legos are all a different mineral. The hell was that? Um, these gray Legos are all a different mineral. Red could be a different mineral. You get the point, right? When slammed together and built into something cool, turns into a rock, i.e. this badass Lego kit of Sally Ride and Mae Jemison, uh, two awesome women in science who uh, go to space like badasses. Oh God, her helmet's gone. May take your helmet back. Can't go into space without that. So, rock, right? It's built up from all of these different little parts, i.e. minerals. Just think about minerals as the building blocks of rocks. So, now that we've defined a mineral, we know the difference between a rock and a mineral, I think it's time we, uh, we take a little field trip. Follow me. So as it turns out, um, University of Wisconsin here has a pretty awesome geology museum. Thought we should, uh, Let's go ahead and check that out. What is that? That's insane. It's so cool. You see how shiny it is? So geologists call that luster, or rather how minerals interact with light. The face of the mineral, how it interacts with light is called luster. And it's one of the diagnostic tools that geologists use to identify different minerals. Here's a really good example of pyrite, um, commonly known as fool's gold. It has what we call a metallic luster. So there's all sorts of different kinds of lusters and that's just one example. Oh my gosh. Here, 
come over here and I'll show you this. This is insane. So see all these guys? See how cool those are? Yeah, they're not that cool. Except for that they are. That's outrageous. It's like friggin' Avatar. So that's enough of that madness. Just crazy. That's all just to say that uh, minerals are, I mean, just the breadth of them, as you can see from just looking at the minerals here in this museum. Um, you know, some people spend their entire lives studying minerals and we're just scratching the surface in the course of this video and hopefully the class you're taking, but um, there's a lot to know about minerals. So it can get pretty overwhelming, um, all the possible minerals you can find on the face of this planet. It's nuts. Uh, but for most geologists, myself included, there's really you know, probably about 30 that we deal with on a relatively regular basis. And we call these the rock forming minerals. And these are the most common minerals that make up the Earth's crust. And these can be grouped into different groups. You may have seen um, some of the signs in the museum here, like silicates and carbonates and sulfides and sulfates and halides and oxides and hydroxides, I think are the, are the major ones. And each one of those, um, the groupings are designated by the major ion that forms that mineral. For example, with uh, silicates, the silica ion and the oxygen ions, there's four oxygen ions to every one silicon ion. And that tetrahedra is what we call it. Actually, a good example is using tennis balls. If you imagine that each one of these tennis balls is a big old oxygen ion. Um, and in the middle of all four of these is a tiny little silicon ion. And this is what we call a tetrahedra, right? And these silica tetrahedra link up in a myriad of different ways and just chains, as double chains, as sheets, or just by themselves to create all of the silicate uh, minerals in the silicate group. The carbonates use the carbonate ion as the major um, building block of the carbonate minerals, and that's one carbon to three oxygen. Um, oxides and halides and hydroxides and sulfates and sulfides all have their primary um, ions that they build minerals around. Um, so I'm not gonna dig into all of those. That's kind of beyond the, the scope of where I wanted to go with this video. But despite the myriad of minerals you see, and I've shown you in this museum here, um, most geologists, unless you're a mineralogist, um, usually deal with more or less around 30, really the rock forming minerals, the major minerals in the Earth's crust. It's pretty cool. Some crazy stuff out there, man. Oh. I didn't know half those minerals. Uh, I think the last thing I wanted to go over in the course of this video is just broadly how geologists identify um, and differentiate minerals in the field. Uh, and so, for example, if I'm walking out into the field and I find these two minerals, I don't know what they are off the top of my head. There are things that geologists do which help us identify and differentiate some of these minerals. These two are pretty different, so maybe not the best example, but you'll see where I'm going. So, uh, the first thing that we often do is what's called the Mohs hardness test. So this guy, Frederick Moe, I think his name is, yeah, was an Austrian geologist back in the early 1900s that decided it would be super helpful to be able to differentiate minerals based on their hardnesses. That's what this is. This is Mohs hardnesses. So these numbers here are uh, Mohs hardness scale, and it's just a scale from 1 to 10, 1 being soft and 10 being hard, right? So in the mineral world, when we're, when we're identifying uh, the hardness of minerals, it's really a scratch or get scratched world, and that's really what it is. So if I'm trying to figure out which mineral is harder, I can take orthoclase here and quartz, and whichever one scratches the other is harder, right? Pro tip when you're doing this, do it both ways. So take the quartz and try and scratch the orthoclase and take the orthoclase and try and scratch the quartz. And then, then you know which one's harder. And so these are the assigned Mohs hardness scales for this. So we know that quartz is a seven on Mohs scale. Your fingernail, for example, is a 2.5. So when I'm out in the field, if one of these minerals scratches my fingernails, I know it's harder than a 2.5 on most scale. Diamonds, for example, you've probably heard that diamonds uh, are super hard. They are in fact a 10 on most hardness scale. And that's why I don't actually have um, a 10 on here because 
diamond, obviously. Most hardness scale, in a nutshell, is does your mineral scratch or get scratched by something with a known hardness? Cleavage is another thing geologists look at when they're trying to identify minerals, and it's effectively a mineral's tendency to break along a plane or planes, um, and as you might guess, has to do a lot with the atomic structure uh, of the mineral, but we're not gonna get into that. When we're classifying cleavage, we kind of look at the number of planes that a mineral breaks into, uh, and then the overall pattern that the mineral cleaves into. Muscovite, for example, if we come back to muscovite, breaks on one plane, sheet-like, right? That's, that's one way of describing it, is sheet-like, um, and it breaks super easily. So we look at the number of planes, the overall pattern, and then often geologists will also classify it in terms of its uh, quality, so whether or not it cleaves easily or really difficult, um, and then the cleanliness of the cleavage. So, for example, muscovite's classified as perfect cleavage because it just peels off. This gets a little subjective, I think, uh, but that's, that's kind of the standard. And different minerals will cleave in different ways that can be very diagnostic of that mineral. Muscovite's a perfect example. Calcite's another good example. So, cleavage. So hardness, cleavage, color. A lot of young geologists will just hang their hat on color when identifying minerals. Um, and that's a slippery slope because I think this is a great example. Uh, fluorite can come in kind of a myriad of colors. I'm not going to get into the, the details there. Certainly use color to narrow your thoughts down as far as what the mineral could be, but don't only use color because uh, the same mineral can often be different shades or even completely different colors. Streak. The idea is that regardless of the color of the mineral, when streaked on a streak plate, um, when you break down the mineral to its you know, fine powdered constituents, it's always going to leave the same streak color. So magnetite, for example, will leave a really dark streak color. Um, and that can be diagnostic of certain minerals that might look the same, but streak different. Luster. We talked about luster downstairs in the geology museum, so I don't feel like I really have to go um, over that again. Uh, as a reminder, luster is just how that mineral interacts with the light around it. And I think the last thing we look at is actual chemical reactions. So it turns out that certain minerals react with certain chemicals that can be super helpful in diagnosing the mineral. Um, calcite is a wonderful example. Calcium carbonate uh, reacts with hydrochloric acid. So geologists will always carry a, uh, a diluted bottle of hydrochloric acid, which is super helpful in identifying carbonate minerals like, like this calcite here. So as an example, if we drop a little drop on there, you can see it just fizz away. And so if, for example, I was struggling between identifying this and quartz, I could drop this acid on it uh, and it would do nothing on quartz. Whereas here it's very diagnostic of calcite. So finally, there's a there's a couple other things that we can do to identify like very specific minerals. Um, magnets, for example, as you might guess by its name, magnetite is magnetic, um, and that's diagnostic of magnetite. Uh, the density of a mineral, uh, and that's just mass per volume, right? So if you get two minerals of approximately the same size that might look the same but have different densities, significantly different weights, that can be a diagnostic tool as far as differentiating different minerals. Uh, so in review, we have you know, hardness, cleavage, uh, color, streak, luster, uh, chemical reactions, and then things like magnetism and density, and all of these different tools help us identify uh, these different minerals. So next time you're out in the field or in the lab, doing a minerals lab, for example, uh, thinking about all of these things will help you differentiate uh, all these different minerals. Thanks for hanging out. I'm Ethan, and uh, I'll see you next time.